Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining us here at the San Francisco Public Library. We're really pleased to welcome back Dante King to talk about how anti-blackness has permeated American Christian institutions and how it is still with us today in our culture. He has his book with him today, The 400-Year Holocaust, White America's Legal, Psychopathic, and Sociopathic Black Genocide and the, and the Revolt Against Critical Race Theory that he was gonna have for sale after our talk today. But before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that we are located in the area known as, the San, Francisco, as San Francisco, which is on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramai Tushaloni peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramai Tushaloni have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland, and as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. So I've taken several trainings with, with Dante when he used to work for the city, and he used to say, it's gonna get deep. So before I bring him out to the stage, I just wanna give a little brief introduction Dante King is a native of San Francisco, California. He is an author of the new book, The 400-Year Holocaust, and he is also a professor of American history, African American history, and black studies. His research interests include the intersections of race, racism, and legality throughout pre- and post-colonial America, and King currently serves as guest faculty at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, as well as the Mayo Clinic, or Mayo Clinic. So please join me in welcoming Dante King. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for um, being here today. I truly appreciate the, the continued support that my work um, has received. I see uh, some people in the audience who are special to me, uh, Ms. Brenda Barros and uh, Ms. Ingrid Cobb and Mrs. Cheryl Thornton. Um, and I also want to take this time to give some thanks to a few people before we get started. So uh, to Shauna, Ms. Shauna Sherman here, um, at San Francisco Public Library. I really appreciate you and your allyship and continued support. Uh, Ms. Alexis Cobbins, uh, who is on the way, my dear sister Marguerite Malloy, who will be joining me in discussion after I complete this lecture. Um, Ms. Jayantra Henderson, who's here, who has been my personal assistant for more than almost four, actually almost four years. Um, she keeps me going and is, is really responsible for uh, me being able to be here and elsewhere. So um, I want to give thanks to Marcel Walker, who is my best friend, um, spiritual partner, and also uh, on my team of, uh, my, in my, my family of assistants that um, make this possible. I want to recognize my godmother, Sarah Fine, my godfather, Dr. Larry Short, uh, Lauren Newman, who's responsible for um, the designing of the fl uh, flyers, uh, Jessica Brown, um, Lori Smith Anderson, uh, Vic Vicki and Maceo Trotter, who, is, who, who are here today, uh, doing some videography, and we'll be putting together highlights uh, from this, from this uh, experience. I also want to recognize the uh, San Francisco Public Library staff and the videographers who are here, the, the AV uh, team. Um, I'm thankful for my brother, Dewan King, for my father, Harold King, um, and all of my family. Um, the San Francisco librarian, Michael Lambert, uh, thank you so much for your support and also making this possible to 
Kate and Steve, uh, Kate Levinson and Steve Costa, who um, have really become angels in my life and, and guides. I'm so grateful for them. And last but not least, and I have a slide here, I'll come back to that, but my dear, sweet, beautiful mother, um, who is my best friend. She is responsible for me being able to breathe life every day. And she um, has nurtured me, her commitment to nurturing me and providing love and care and sensitivity throughout all of my, my life. There are just not enough words. Um, she couldn't be here today because she is at home, um, recovering and getting well. And, um, you know, that, that's it. I just adore my mom. Isn't she beautiful? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we can give her a hand. <laughs> I adore her. So, um, I, as Shauna mentioned, I have books that are for sale here. If you haven't gotten a copy, I will be signing them uh, in, during the five minute intermission as well as after. Um, let me go back. So we are gonna talk about, and there's a handheld here. Here we go, hello, hello. It's on, okay, I got it. Thank you, okay. So for those of you who know me, you know I don't like to stand in one place, okay? So <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about the evolution and normalcy of white supremacy and anti-blackness in academic, scientific, and medical philosophy. Raise your hand if you've uh, heard about that previously. You've explored some of that topic. Okay, um, you're gonna become very familiar with it today. The usage of such philosophies to reinforce and legitimize systematic violence and genocide through criminality, lynching, rape, sterilization, economic deprivation, and all other debasement. So these philosophies uh, have been used and continue to be used, and we still use them today uh, against black people. We're also going to talk about how this uh, set up the the playbook for Adolf Hitler and what prevailed in 1930s Germany and uh, le leading to the, the Holocaust. So we'll start off, we're gonna, I'm gonna share some slides with you and then we'll do a brief activity. And as I'm sharing this information with you in these few slides that we will um, explore during this beginning, I want you to begin thinking about one takeaway from just the few slides I'm going to, going to share with you to set this up. You got that? Okay, wonderful. So we have in 1636, um, the first academic institution being set up in the colony of uh, Massachusetts Bay, um, Harvard University. How many of you are familiar with Harvard? Okay, so it's set up and uh, established by clergyman John Harvard, who is an English minister and also a slave owner. Uh, we have William and Mary College, which is founded as a public research institution in 1693 by King William III and uh, Queen Mary II. We have Yale that's uh, established in 1701, uh, renamed after the British trader merchant uh, Elihu Yale. Then there's Princeton in 1746, and it's established by uh, Presbyterian ministers, John Dickinson, Aaron Burr Sr., John Witherspoon, who's noted as one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, as well as William Tennant. We then move on to Columbia University, um, which was established in the colony of New York in 1754. And just quickly, you don't have to say anything, but just by show of hands, are any of you recognizing any specific or particular themes as you're seeing these slides, by show of hands? Okay. Um, there's the University of Pennsylvania, which is founded by Benjamin Franklin, as well as George Whitefield, um, who has some association with the Anglican uh, Church. They are both noted as founding fathers of the United States. This university is founded in 1755. Then there's Brown University that's founded by James Manning 
um, John Brown uh, and Moses Brown, who have, are, are all associated with the Baptist church. These are Baptist ministers. Um, and so John Brown, who's a slave trader, um, it's noted that uh, Moses Brown was an abolitionist, but who knows? Um, so the, they have a, an intertwined or, or intertwined affiliations with both um, Christianity and religion, as well as uh, trafficking in, in African humans. You all got that? And these are the, these are the uh, founders of, of knowledge, of education in the continent of, of America post the 16th century. So it, we're, this is in the, into the 17th and 18th centuries, okay? Um, Rutgers University, named after Henry, Henry Rutgers in 1766. And then lastly, Dartmouth, which is established in 1769, okay? Um, take a moment and find someone or locate someone that is either seated next to you, or if you don't have anyone seated next to you, turn around maybe. And I want you to share just one reaction to the slides that I just shared with you, because again, I want to reinforce that these are the establishers and framers of what becomes known or recognized, rather, as knowledge, as education, as intellect. These are the people who are responsible for setting the educational and academic landscape for what would become known to your ancestors and people who have come before us as knowledge, as the only set of, of knowledge or education. They are responsible for the tools and the resources that have inculcated each one of you as you sit here today. So I want you to talk just very briefly uh, about just a, a quick takeaway, all right? 45 seconds. <laughs> all right. So if you hear my voice, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Um, any interesting thoughts come up for you? Or how many of you had interesting thoughts come up, come up for you? As a, yeah. Um, I think it's so important to do that type of setup or share th that context because wh what we're now going to do is take a look at the type of philosophies that begin to emerge as a result of these institutions and people who came out of these institutions who were then incentivized and positioned to develop philosophies and educational frameworks that were um, noted or held as scientific, as academic, as expert uh, philosophies or expert um, framing, the, uh, yeah, philosophies that begin to circulate or be circulated widely, okay? So when we look at the impact, so what, does the, what impact does white supremacy have on the entire educational and academic framework in America? What then is education at its core? And so when you begin to dig into those questions, what you will see is that education in America um, is just another institution to indoctrinate people to serve the interests of white people. Um, it is to serve them in their economic system. It is to serve them on modern day plantations that um, we look at now for instance, such as the institution of the city and county of San Francisco, Google, Facebook, um, Twitter, any uh, modern day labor institution that you can look around. All of our, um, our, our, our only place here is to really serve the interest of white people and most specifically white men um, who make up the boards of these institutions, the chairpersons of these institutions, the, the CEOs, CFOs of these institutions. And so, again, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, what then is education at its core? Okay. The other thing that I want to uh, emphasize, though, is the 
um, is that, rather, in America, all of America's economies, starting with the institution of slavery, have been uh, built with a common, or built upon a common foundation. And that common foundation is black suffering and pain. Does that make sense? And I'll just say this, this is not gonna be a, a main focal point in this lecture, but we move uh, from a free labor market or free labor force during, from the institution of slavery or, or the enslavement of, of African people. We move from no wage labor, I mean from no wage labor to low wage labor. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, um, segregation, the jail system, the prison industrial system, which I, I focused on uh, during my last lecture here, all have um, psychoeconomic and psychopolitical purposes. They serve a function um, because it's not just that we have, let's say, one million black uh, men and women or 1.2 or some million who make up the, the prisons. People are employed to manage them. Does that make sense? Um, the educational uh, system or school system, um, we are circulating black youth through these institutions who, by the time they are in preschool, they're being suspended. That serves a purpose because the more that you can uh, suspend these children, the more that you can uh, adversely impact their psychological ability to function, and to do well and perform well and to stifle their confidence, the more you make them angry, the more you disenfranchise them, the more you will have people that you can rationalize and justify sending to prisons. Um, when schools make special ed referrals, for instance, they receive more money. Does that make sense? Okay, so. Education, religion, politics, economics, legality, labor, and all other institutions, and all institutions, have been designed, influenced, and controlled by a European Anglo-Saxon, i.e. white, psychological and sociological, they've been controlled by, by white psychological and sociological patterns and frameworks. Uh, America is an experiment of white legal, cultural, and social control. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Okay, um, and I always say this, you don't have to agree, because <laughs> this is my research and uh, you would have had to have my experiences and really uh, endeavored into all of the sources that I have in order to, to fully agree, so I recognize that. So Dr. Amos Wilson, he says, culture is a means by which a group of people organize the way that they think, believe, and see the world, so as to create a consciousness by which they cooperate in achieving certain ends so that they can mutually aid each other and gain ends that they cannot gain as separate individuals. Culture is an instrument of power. The individual through culture extends the power of the group. So I'm going to, uh, in my book, I reframe this. <laughs> so white culture is an experiment of conspiratorial, conspiratorial assemblage a means by which white people have organized the way that they think, believe, and see the world, so as to create a consciousness by which they cooperate in achieving certain ends so that they can mutually aid each other and gain ends that they cannot gain as separate individuals. White supremacy culture is an instrument of power. Okay. So I'm going to uh, refer to works by Dr. Harriet Washington and her work on Medical Apartheid, uh, Dorothy Roberts, her book, Killing the Black Body, um, Deidre Cooper Owens and her work around medical bondage, as well as uh, Michelle Browder, Dr. Dr. Catherine Bencole Medina, and Dr. Bobby Wright, to name a few. I'm gonna share info from others as well. Um, so white supremacy and anti-blackness and in, in the influence on scientific racism. So we're gonna talk about the impacts of all of this on culture, on shaping the, the, the cultural psychology and sociology around white supremacy and anti-blackness. So we have um, in the early 19th century, really, Dr. Charles Caldwell, he's the first one, and he's come, he comes out of um, 
the University of Pennsylvania, okay? And he introduces the mind science of phrenology. So phrenology is a pseudoscience which involves the measurement of bumps on the skull to produce mental traits. So he looked at brains, per his own observations, <laughs> and established that because black people, when he looked at the skulls of, of black individuals, they had uh, less bumps on their skulls. And he argued that uh, our rightful place as African people or people of African descent was slavery. Because from his observations of looking at different uh, brain formations or the bumps on brains, we had less. Okay, so turn to your neighbor and say, um, phrenology. Turn to your neighbor and say, fit, fit for enslavement due to a lack of intelligence. And one of the main themes that I want to invite you to pay attention to is really how these individuals made up. They made up these philosophies. And yet, they were also positioned inside of these highly ranked, highly regarded, world-renowned, academic institutions. They were incentivized and they were rewarded, okay? Um, so you have people like President Thomas Jefferson who, um, you know, latches on to these types of theories. He says, I advance it therefore as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. We then go to Dr. John Van Every. Dr. John Van Every says in his book, um, Negroes and Negro Slavery, God has made the Negro an inferior being, not in most cases, but in all cases. Turn to your neighbor and say, but in all cases. But white men as equal. Dr. John Van Every espoused the concept that the different races were six distinct species, with the Caucasian being superior to all others, and that any attempt to abolish slavery would result in the universal degradation and destruction of the white blood of America, with consequent overthrow of Republican institutions and, indeed, the new civilization and Christianity of the new world. When have we heard this? <laughs> it's, it's been very uh, present, manifest, uh, manifested in, in our current environment. It's, it's been very present here lately. Um, and so what we, what we need to understand is the compulsive need for a group of people to situate themselves as superior, to be able to have others that they can see as less or inferiorize so that they can have value. All right. Dr. James Marion Sims, uh, 1845, and his, his work on vaginal, perfecting vaginal surgery he bought 11 black women, kept them in a laboratory, and used them as experimental subjects to be uh, used in this surgery where he was perfecting a certain surgical technique um, to be used in correcting obstructed childbirth conditions. The condition was called vesicle vaginal fistula. Um, he not only bought these women, but he did not use anesthesia on them, any type of anesthesia at all. Um, and even though there were um, anesthetics available during this, this time period, they weren't necessarily prevalent here in America. The first anesthetic being used in America was cocaine, um, and that was in 1859. However, he could have used them if he wanted to. He repeatedly operated on one of the black women, uh, the, an African woman named Anarka, more than 30 times. He went to Jefferson Medical College um, and around this time, you have the President Andrew Johnson, who would become Lincoln's successor, actually. 
He says, if blacks were given the right to vote, that would place every splay-footed, bandy-shanked, humpback, thick-lipped, flat-nosed, woolly-headed, ebon-colored Negro in the country upon an equality with the poor white man. And so you have these philosophies that are being used to rationalize and justify our place in this society, what people begin to think of us widespread. And these philosophies are being developed and created through academic institutions. Do, do any of you understand how powerful that is? Because if all of society is looking to these experts, to tell us what things are, who people are, what their place is in society. It's a situating of black people into a permanent underclass that can never be undone because it is being inbred into the psyches of people. How many of you understand that no policy whatsoever can ever solve for this? There's not enough money that you can give to black people that are gonna change the minds of the larger society and even some of us as black people so that we can see each other through a different lens. The view of black humanity is unfavorable. Does that make sense? We have a negative orientation that's been built in. So we, we go to Samuel Cartwright. Everyone say Dr. Samuel Cartwright. He establishes two conditions, one being drapedomania, that any black person wanting to free themselves from slavery had a mental illness, and the other one was diesthesia ethiopica, the lack of work ethic amongst black people. They're just lazy. So I want you to just share briefly with the person behind you, what is the impact on these academic scientific philosophies and the, their influence on, on culture at large. 30 seconds each. All right, if you hear my voice, go ahead and raise your hand. So let's hear what Dr. Cartwright said. He, he went to University of Pennsylvania, by the way. He says, it is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their minds when under the white man's control. It is the want of sufficiency of red vital blood that changed their <laughs> that changed their minds to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. So we have a different blood than white people. Are you, all, are you all seeing this? This represents, these people represent America's best. They represent the epitome of what it means to be white. And so they're building not only their legal system to disenfranchise black people, but the entire educational system that works to inform not only white doctors, but Asian doctors, Hispanic doctors, uh, black doctors, of how to deal with black people. I, my mother right now is, is recovering from an illness, and I have been her main caretaker in terms of correspondence with doctors. And I have had to, in layman's terms, <laughs> check a few people because they deal with black people in very different ways. And I have had to let them know I'm very familiar with the ways uh, psychosis has been embedded into the medical field so that you don't provide black individuals with optimal care and that this will not be the case with my mother. It won't. Um, so, he became known, Dr. Cartwright, as the expert in Negro medicine. He argued that slavery was beneficial for black people for medical reasons, because we had lower lung capacity, 
And so forced labor would be good. Turn to your neighbor and say, forced labor would be good for them. <laughs> okay? How many of you are finding this? In, in my book, I talk about the, the, the um, psycho, psych, psychopathy and the sociopathy of, of whiteness and white people. How many of you are seeing that? I, I use words such as maniacal, diabolical. How many of you can see that and what what's being shared here? Okay, let's continue. So I'm going to actually skip past this. We, we then go to Dr. Josiah Knott, who was credited with um, developing the science of polygenism, skull studies, which, had, which concluded each race had a different origin. Dr. Knott argued the skull formations of white people made them superior, and enslavement was the perfect condition for black people because of the ways our skulls were shaped. So we can look at the skulls of black people and rationalize and justify why the, the condition of enslavement is the right place. It's the right situation for them. So, well, I'll wait to make that point. So he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania again. He was a professor of surgery, founder of the Medical College of Alabama. These people found institutions. <laughs> they um, decide what type of philosophies would permeate through the, these institu institutions. Uh, they went abroad, they traveled abroad to different places and told them you know, about the very wonderful academic landscape that was being established here in America. And so you have not just this country being influenced or, you know, just, I don't know. You, you, it's more than just America. It's, it's global phenomena. Does that make sense? Okay. He argued that black people were creational rank between Greeks and chimpanzees in terms of intelligence. So what then does it mean to be educated, intellectual, or an academic? What is education? What is academia? What is science? Who are the moral and academic authorities on scientific and or philosophical theory? I'm gonna give you two minutes to take one of these questions and discuss them. All right, if you hear my voice, go ahead and clap once. Clap once. <laughs> if you hear my voice, go ahead and clap twice. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so um, Cheryl Harris, who is a school, uh, a professor of law at UCLA School of Law, she says, moreover, as it emerged, the concept of whiteness was premised on white supremacy rather than mere difference. White was defined and constructed in ways that increased its value by reinforcing its exclusivity. How many of you see the increasing of what it means to be white by the scientific philosophies that are being established? There's nothing wrong with us. It's them, 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 them. So let us create these philosophies and rationales that, in, that directly influence the ideological value structure here in America so that we can, by principle, by scientific principle, establish that we are superior and that all else are inferior. And we're going to make up explanations and create details to rationalize and justify and explain how non-white people, and most specifically black people, are inferior. And so this is a, you know, I know that there is a lot of conversation um, and discussion many times around how um, is, is the oppression, how has the oppression been different with, with black Americans? You know, black people seem to be so angry because, you know, they experience racism, but you know, I'm Hispanic or I'm Asian and I've experienced racism too. I've experienced white racism too. It's different. It's different. You didn't have academic uh, philosophies 
that explained away your humanity in ways that uh, allowed for the dehumanization of your community. And it it's also in, embedded into entertainment, uh, in, in, um, in terms of minstrel shows that begin to emerge during the, the 19th century. It's also prevalent in criminality because these scientific and academic philosophies begin to be used by the legal system to determine what criminals look like. So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, a foolproof plan on how to enact and normalize genocide. Because you get everyone to buy in to, to how black people are inferior. And it's on a spectrum. Because that black may not be as bad as that black. You get what I'm saying? But we can still lock them up if they're murdered. Let's not feel any empathy. And I'm, I'm going to challenge you. I want you to go away out of here. I'm going to give you homework from when you go, go from here. Go and locate five news stories about a, um, about a tragedy that has happened to a black person or a black family. I guarantee you most of the comments that you're going to find um, in the story will be questioning what did that person do to experience that, to have that tragedy come upon them. It's not, it, they won't be filled with comments of compassion or empathy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just go and look at five videos on YouTube or five news stories. Okay, so whiteness is a political organization created and structured for the purposes of power, supremacy, domination, exclusion, and oppression through legal, social, cultural, psychic, emotional, economic, and all other institutional power and control mechanisms. It encompasses the vilification and villainizing of people considered non-white and most severely humans labeled as black people and or African American for the purposes of spiritual, emotional, psychic, economic, physical comfort and gain. Dr. Thomas Roderick Drew, graduate of, uh, or actually the 13th president of William and Mary College, professor of history and metaphysics, a supporter of slavery. He argued that enslaved black people were not fit for the condition of freedom, so their rightful place was there. We need to keep them there. Because it turned to your neighbor to say, because it's scientific. Mm -hmm. Orson Fowler and Samuel Wells, and I tell you, when, when I found this, I almost fell out of my chair. When I found this, I almost fell out of my chair. I was at my uh, computer just researching and, and studying away. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so you'll see. So they are um, the, uh, the uh, founders of the Fowler and Wells Company, a scientific institution that had wor a worldwide reputation for 57 years. They maintained an office in New York City for over a half a century. Do you all understand that? Okay, watch where this is going. They, they became the leaders in the phrenological and physiological and hygienic sciences. For half a century, they were the main educators in these branches of study. So everyone who studied after them re referenced them. They referred to them in their work, okay? They were the first in America to give the science of phrenology a practical value by making special delineations of character. So Mr. Fowler went to the University of Massachusetts. Um, they developed these pamphlets and books on how to read good character. So we can tell how to read character. We're the experts in that. Do you all understand how maniacal this is? Okay, so watch this. Physiognomy, Dr. Wells, he establishes the science of physiognomy. Say that with me, physiognomy. Okay, so physiognomy is the practice of assessing a person's character and intelligence or personality from their outer appearance. We can just tell by looking at people. So varying grades of intelligence. 
We're going to make up drawings of, of what symbolizes intelligence and what, <laughs> I can see the gentleman shaking his head, because it's, it's unbelievable. So we can tell whether someone is intelligent, unintelligent, has the capacity to develop intelligence or not develop intelligence just by looking at them. Bearing in mind, this is page 126 of this book, New Physiognomy, bearing in mind then its limitations and modifications, it is well in all cases when making a physiognomical examination to observe the facial angle. Face figure 142 will help to convey an idea of the different grades of development and intelligence as indicated in the profile, size, as well as form being taken into the account. And this is taught in anthropological theory and research. And these are the experts in this field. And so such types of philosophies then influenced rape laws. And so you have black women being excluded from rape laws that were established to protect white women only. And when going to court with these cases, these academic theories were presented to juries. They were presented to the judge on, on why it was permissible to rape black women. And I, I include in here one of the cases I referred to in my last presentation here back in May 2022. This was the uh, George V. State ruling in Mississippi, the Mississippi Supreme Court, which was argued against a black male slave who had raped a nine-year-old black girl on a plantation. And the court concluded that rape could only be committed upon a white woman. Here's what the, 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 the transcript said. The crime of rape does not exist in this state between African slaves. Our laws recognize no marital status as between slaves. Their intercourse is left to be regulated by their owners. The regulations of law as to the white race on the subject of sexual intercourse do not and cannot, for obvious reasons, apply to slaves. Their intercourse is promiscuous and the violation of a female slave by a male slave would be a mere assault and battery. And so the scientific academic philosophies influenced how black women and black men and girls and boys were dealt with through the court system, through the legal system. Because we have academic philosophies and ideological principles to back it up. How many of you are seeing what's possible when you justify and rationalize something through your educational model, your cultural model, your value structure? You can demonize and degrade in the worst ways, anyone you choose. And so we haven't, I haven't talked about Adolf Hitler yet, but can you see how he looked to America and what was going on here? Okay. Abraham Lincoln, 1858, this is in a synod race, he says, I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this, and I will say in addition to this, that there is a physical difference you all understand that? There is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races by living together on terms of social and political equality. He is obsessively preoccupied with the physical difference, as all of these scientists are. Black people. Do you understand what I am trying to emphasize to you here today? There is an obsession that is predicated upon the way we look that allows for continued
dehumanization, and we will never be able to escape it because white people in this country have trained everyone in the society to be sociopaths when it comes to black people. So we go to Harvard, Dr. Agassiz. He argued that black people were created along with other beasts and animals in the Garden of Eden. Turn to your neighbor and say, Harvard. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's, it's the, one of the best schools. It's, it's one of the top schools in the nation. Now turn to your neighbor and say, psychopaths. These academic principles justified lynching of black men and women. They justified our, our castration. They justified rape. And as a community, people just gathered around and took pictures. And not only did they take pictures, they situated themselves in the photo so that they could smile and give a presentation of what was being done because they knew that there would be no accountability. Because we have the best of the best creating theories to justify it. For the men and women, this is from the book Without Sanctuary, for the men and women who comprise these mobs, as for those who remain silent or indifferent, or who provided the scientific scholarly explanations, this was the highest idealism in the service of their race in preservation of their heritage. So anti-blackness, as I define it in my book, The 400-Year Holocaust, is a white American legal, social, cultural, economic, institutional values and belief system. It involves the deprioritization of humans labeled as black people, as well as the criminalization, and let me be clear what I mean by criminalization, criminality is situated onto black identity. And I'm, not use, I'm using it in, the context that in, in a context that is broader than how we typically refer to that word in terms of the legal system. I am saying that on your jobs, you won't be promoted because your, criminal, <laughs> your criminalized identity precedes you. And having worked in human resources management for more than 15 years and I've run recruitment processes for different leaders at different organizations. I have seen it all the time. There is a presumption of potential that precedes white and Asian people. I think they're gonna be good for the team because they seem like a self-starter. They seem motivated. They seem highly efficient. They seem, they seem, they seem. You're able to tell all of that in 30 minutes. But this black woman or black man comes through the door they don't seem like they're gonna be the right fit. They, I, did, I don't think that they exuded enough confidence. They didn't have enough momentum. Do you understand? Rationalize, rationalizing what, <laughs> that the person is not capable or competent, competent to fill the role. So, um, it's the, the criminalization Hypernegativity, turn to your neighbor and say, it's not just negativity. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's hypernegativity. Okay, it's, it's not just a scrutiny, a simple scrutiny, it's hyper scrutiny. And negative positioning, it's the negative positioning of black people in this culture throughout all aspects of American society and life for the purposes, it serves a purpose 
for the purposes of justifying and rationalizing political, social, cultural, economic debasement and inhumane treatment, ultimately genocide. In black people, the illness in the black community is that we have accepted it. We have assumed agreement in this culture through force and deceit, but now of our own volition. Because we have to seem better than the average or lower class Negro. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So American culture socializes and trains people to develop and possess innate psychological and emotional reflexes and impulses that react negatively to black people, especially black people who do not conform to and or emulate white sociocultural standards. How does this evidence support the framing of my book subtitle, White America's Legal, Psychopathic, and Sociopathic Black Genocide? I'll give you one minute each to share a quick answer to this question. How does the evidence that I presented here for you today explain this framing, which is in the subtitle of my book? I'll give you two minutes. All right, if you hear my voice, go ahead and clap once. I'm going to ask, is there anyone who wants to share very uh, briefly what you discussed or what came to mind for you in, in, terms, of, in, your, in terms of a response to this question? Uh, oh, just, and then we'll come to you, Brenda. One second. Basically, what you revealed was the blueprint to establishing not only just the legal system, but such integral um, legal systems like the labor board, yes. which reinforced slavery after slavery and created the wage and the perpetuation of jobs in America still today, where you have the, the white overseer coming on on all jobs like you said, it, it was stated that you couldn't uh, elevate. It was a glass ceiling because the overseer mentality was destroying all of the blueprints. Can I encourage you to um, shift your language a little bit? Yes. Okay. It's an anti-black overseer mentality. Yes, it is. It's and it's a, it's a mentality and a set of values and principles that have been assumed by even people who look like you and me. I agree. And so this, it, it provides the justification as to why we can't promote that black individual because we see them in this way, we can't let go of it. Um, it provides the justification for why they are paid less or, or lower and why we are paid um, the highest in terms of um, economic posi uh, positioning. And, and so we have to then understand that these, um, these conditions serve a purpose. They, they serve the, the white psyche. They serve white psychological reasoning and, and functioning in terms of what they, how they uh, see themselves in this culture, in this country. We also have to understand that this country, when it was established, it was built for them. It was not built for us at all. We are not supposed to be alive. We're not supposed to be here. We're only here so much as it serves the purpose to provide the low wage labor force. Um, and it, it also provides the, the psychopolitical functioning of black inferiority to maintain white superiority, it's a caste system. We're, we're needed here in order for white people to have value. And that's true for Asians, it's true for Hispanics, not as in depth or not as severe, but that is how it functions. And so we then, you know, for as much as people talk about all of the work that has been done by black civil rights activists and, and, and white allies to get rid of anti-black racism and white supremacy, it will never leave. 
It won't because it is the foundation of this country's culture, institutions, everything. And in order to survive it, black people, and this is true for me, I'm here today because I've been groomed by white people in order to navigate these institutions. And they have been comfortable with me and provided support and everything because I've accepted the assimilative nature, speech, presentation, that provides that they would be or have a certain level of comfort with me. And so I, you know, when I'm doing the, my work, as much as my work is a critique of whiteness, white psychopathy, white sociopathy, I then have to critique blackness because these people are responsible for our existence and they've controlled the legal, educational, political, economic, religious landscape that we have acclimated to. And I say very firmly in my book, black people, black American people have never known a reality outside of the existence of white people and they have dominated us. We have accepted every model of progress based upon their standards. Every model of what is bad, not right, what is acceptable, what's good, civil, based upon their standards. We've never known a reality without white domination. Can you see it, black people? Is it penetrating through your body? Yeah. And it's done the most harm because then we don't provide a level of understanding, empathy, compassion to those blacks who've been caught up who've been ravaged by this culture and its systems. Brenda. So you kind of spoke to what I was gonna say. Um, talking to my partner here who's 24 years old and the things and the opinions and what's in his head, which has been driven in his head because he was educated in the South. Uh, it is very clear that uh, this is something, a definite miseducation of, of black people. Absolutely. Period. In every way. And so, you know, when, when you have people that are young like that who say, um, you hear them say things like, well, you know, I just, I just have to change, I have to do what they want yes. in order to get what I want. Yes. That's, that's disheartening. Absolutely. So we're going to move on. Cheryl, I'm going to give you 20 seconds, okay? <laughs> you know I know Cheryl, right? Uh, okay. I, 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 after hearing this, what I think about in today's terms, like what's going on right now is reparations. You're just making the case for it again. But that how you talk about the psychopath and sociopath and why we cannot get promoted and the employment discrimination that we face because we're descendants of slaves and they see us that way based on the policies and the culture of the 400 years. Yeah. So I just want to, you just reinforce that for me, um, reparations. And um, I just wanted to say that this coming Wednesday, that the state will be doing reparations, please look it up, um, Wednesday and Thursday. It's the last meeting seconds, in Northern Cheryl. California, but please, you know. I'm okay, just joking, but no. Um, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's all good, Cheryl. But I know I appreciate that. And so you said this Wednesday is the last meeting? In, in the Northern California, the last meeting after that will be in L.A., and that's the very last. But okay. So yeah, people should listen in. Okay. But yeah, it's not that people in this country just see us as slaves. 
because I, I want to broaden the, our language around that. They see us as, as having an animalistic nature. They see us as being subhuman, inhuman. There's a negative halo positioned around you. And I, I, you even hear it from some black people. We don't like black hair. We don't like the way our ancestors used to speak. If we have someone in our family that has too much of a Southern drawl or they don't have a command on the language that is uh, necessarily associated with academic uh, uh, presentation, we are embarrassed by them. Yeah. We're embarrassed by them. We've been embarrassed by our grandmothers, our grandfathers. This, this goes so deep into the psyche and when we talk about black women and how aggressive they are and some of them are too dark and they don't uh, represent a symbols or, or uh, the status of what is regarded as attractive in this country, I want to invite all of you to see that as a sickness. It is a sickness that white people have developed, a psychology that they have developed. It is sociopathic and destructive at its core. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's destructive, destructive. at its core. Okay. Okay, so one more and then we're going to, uh, I need to finish. Hi, Dante, it's Karen. Karen, hey. <laughs> um, I was sharing with my partner, Michelle, what my white parents taught me growing up in my all-white community. Uh, you know, I, I went to a school with almost entirely white children, but they would show us films of black people overdosing on heroin in order to deter us from taking drugs. And then at home mm -hmm. on TV, I saw super sensationalized images of black people too. Mm -hmm. So when I asked my parents, you know, what is going on here? Why is there so much racial inequality? My parents said, well, we used to have terrible racial inequality, but then there was a civil rights movement led by Dr. King, who is wonderful, and now opportunities are distributed equally. And some families like ours choose to work really hard and that's why we have what we have and other families choose not to. And that's why they're in the situation that they're in. Yeah. And so the destructive nature of it on, on white people um, is ignorance, is a lack of a learning about truth and, and how white racism and white supremacy culture works and functions every day. It, it is the, the legal system and all of the laws written, how they were written, how they are enforced. It's everything that we know in our existence. And so I appreciate you for um, noting that, Karen, for really raising that. I also wanna ask a question to, how many people in here identify as non-black? by show of hands. Okay, I'm gonna ask you, all of you people who are here, um, if you learned that you somehow had greater value to black people, that you were better than black people, you saw it in your environment when you grew up, it was reinforced and impressed upon you over and over and over again and what you learned in school the books you read, how people were positioned, what you saw in entertainment, on television and magazines, if you learned that you had a greater uh, humanity, that you were better than black people, I want you to stand up. Yeah, thank you so much for being honest. Not everyone can be honest about that question. You, can't, you cannot exist in this society and not learn that, all right? So I'm gonna go on to um, all of these philosophies that I've shared with you up to this point. They served to support and or be leveraged into a science that was then established as eugenics. And so Sir Francis Galton, who is known as the father of eugenics movement, coined this term in 1883 to promote the ideal of perfecting the human race by, as he put it, getting rid of its undesirables while multiplying its desirables. Turn to the person next to you or behind you and say, uh, hold on to that. T tell them desirable and undesirable. Okay? This is a quote from his work. He says, the, the genius producing type 
is slow breeding, and there is some real danger of its loss to mankind. Some idea of the value of these small strains can be gained from the recent statistics by David Starr Jordan, which demonstrate that Massachusetts produces more than 50 times as much genius per 100,000 100, whites as does Georgia, Alabama, or Mississippi. And this is the reasoning that he gave. Although, apparently the race, religion, and environment other than climactic conditions are much the same. Except for the numbing presence in the South of a large Negro population. So let me translate this to you, what he was saying. The reason why whites in the North are more intelligent than whites in the South is because in the South, there are more Negroes. And so just being in, in proximity to black people makes you less intelligent. But you have to understand, these sciences led to the Supreme Court ruling that black people needed to be relegated into ghettos to live separately from white people. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they justify legal principle. Charles Davenport, who established the first eugenics office in 1910, uh, recommended widespread eugenics education. This was circulated in every institution around this country, including immigration laws to keep out the defectives, and forced sterilization of native-born and immigrants. So we have to sterilize people that we deem as retarded, who in some cases may be white. We also have to sterilize the Negroes because we've got to stop their ability to be able to reproduce. Everyone say Dr. Madison Grant. He's an anthropologist, a lawyer. He writes this book in 1916, The Passing of the Great Race which was um, held uh, and highly regarded by Adolf Hitler. And so I'm gonna quote from some of the pages in this book. He went to Yale. He says, whenever the Negro, or when, oh, I'm sorry, whenever the incentive to imitate the dominant race is removed, the Negro, or for that matter, the Indian, reverts shortly to his ancestral grade of culture in other words, it is the individual and not the race that is affected by religion, education, and example. Negroes have demonstrated throughout recorded time that they are a stationary species and that they do not possess the potentiality of progress or initiative from within. Progress from self-impulse must not be confounded with mimicry or with progress imposed from without or by social pressure or by the slaver's lash. Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or white race. So in other words, we must sterilize people who don't meet up to our standards of intelligence, of moral development. A rigid system of selection throughout the elimination of those, I'm sorry, a rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years, as well as enable us to get rid of the undesirables who crowd our jails, hospitals, and insane asylums. The individual himself can be nourished, educated, and protected by the com community during his lifetime, but the state, through sterilization, must see to it that his line stops with him, or else future generations will be cursed with an ever-increasing load of misguided sentimentalism. This is a practical, merciful, and inevitable solution of the whole problem and can be applied to an ever-widening circle 
of social discards beginning always with the criminal, the diseased, and the insane, and extending gradually to types which may be called weaklings rather than defectives, and perhaps ultimately to worthless race types. And so using these types of philosophies, and, and, and Grant's work was like the cream of the crop, you have Virginia establish a sterilization law that is used against this woman named Carrie Buck. And they sterilize her without her consent against her will because they deem her as retarded, okay? They also develop a Racial Integrity Act, which became law the same day that that sterilization act was um, implemented um, to protect the integrity of the white race, the racial integrity of the white race. In 1927, because Buck argued her, her case all the way up to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court ruled that permitting compulsory sterilization of the unfit, including the intellectually disabled, for the protection and health of the state did not violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States. So the United States ruled, essentially, that compulsory sterilization of unfit people, undesirable people, was permissive. It was practically fine. And so every state in the United States of America was required to develop a state eugenical board. I teach a course at UCSF. It's called Understanding the Roots of Racism and Bias, Anti-Blackness, and Its Links to Whiteness, White Racism, Privilege, and Power. And I had a doctor tell me, he attended the course. He said, when I was at Duke University between 1970 and 1974, I worked with the eugenical, uh, uh, the eugenical um, sterilization board um, as, as a, um, I was a resident and I had doctors and, and we worked together to go around and locate 16 year old black virgins and give them hysterectomies. because it was per there was legal precedent. There was academic scientific precedent to be able to do it. So here's what I want to, to know from you, from any and every person that accesses my work, what about this is not sociopathic? What about this is not diabolical? And so you've got Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes saying it is better for the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. 1927, Buck v. Bale. These theories are used to uh, establish, these are the uh, people who developed IQ theory Intelligence. So when, whenever we're talking about IQ, my IQ is high, it's this, it's that. It's all according to white standards, white psychological, diabolical, sociopathic standards that serve to do nothing but relegate black people and non-white people into the bottom of this society. So the development of intelligence in children, Alfred Binet and Mr. Theodore Simon. Okay, again, I mentioned this earlier, won't spend much time here, but these scientific academic principles serve to define how criminals are decided in terms of what they look like, their char characteristics. You've got the Negro sane and Negro civil insane. Shorter, broader, higher head, light, lighter skin color, more woolly. These are your criminals. Certainly you never say, these are what criminals look like. Okay, and then they also justify again, isolating black people away from white people into what become known as ghettos. This is 1910 from a mayor in Baltimore. He says, blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disturbance and to prevent the spread of communicable disease into the nearby white neighborhoods and to protect property values among the white majority. So if they go to our schools, they're gonna lower the value of the school, if they move into our neighborhoods, they're gonna lower the value in the neighborhood. They have different diseases. 
All of this is, is established in America as a psychology and a, socio and a sociology. Um, and so you've got cases like Euclid v. Ambler in 1926 where the Supreme Court decided that racial zoning ordinances, that practice, was permissible. So before redlining, they're saying that only whites can live in this neighborhood by practice, because this is a Supreme Court decision, and that practice is widespread in the early 1900s, even before 1926, because the California Supreme Court upheld that racial zoning ordinances were permissive in 1919, the year my grandmother was born. And then you've got Corrigan v. Buckley in 1926. Let me read this flyer. Attention, white home, home, white home buyers. The largest restricted white community in Washington invites your attention to the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that Negroes cannot buy in a restricted white section. So they, this court ruling established the, the principle of um, builders who were developing deeds and titles for properties. They could only be sold to white people. They could not be sold or resold to black people. How many of you understand that you can never make it out of this type of situation if you are the person or the group of people who are being targeted by show of hands? And there's so much more. So th this decision dismissed any constitutional grounds for challenging racially restrictive covenants and upheld the legal right of property owners to enforce these discriminatory agreements. And all throughout, you know, there were white individuals who were trying to sell properties to black people. They would be sued by the larger white community and taken to court, bankrupt, because they tried to go against these laws. So what is the legal system? What is legality? Who, who is responsible for setting the tone of morality? You can't even walk along the sideline with a black person. White woman and Negro arrested for walking together. This is the early 20th century. A psychological obsession and preoccupation with black inferiority. Um, as America's elite were describing the socially worthless and the ancestrally unfit as bacteria, vermin, mongrels, and subhuman, a superior race of Nordics was increasingly seen as the answer to the globe's eugenic problems. U.S. laws, eugenic investigations, and ideology became blueprints for Germany's rising tide of race biologists and race-based hate mongers. So here on this photo, you have uh, the president uh, of the, or the American executive secretary of the eugenics uh, uh, movement here in the early uh, 20th century, Leon Whitney, acclaims Hitler, hailing Chancellor Adolf Hitler as one of the greatest statesmen and social planners in the world, Leon F. Whitney of New Haven, Connecticut, former executive secretary of the American Eugenics Society, endorses Hitler's sterilization program, which is to be applied to 400,000 Germans considered defectives. You see where this is going? How many of you see, see where this is going? Okay, so Hit, Hitler says, I have studied with interest the laws of several U.S. states concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny would, in all probability, be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock. This is an article written here in America. 15 million Americans defective, they say. Gigantic eugenic enterprise organized for sterilization of unfit of nation. They were going to get rid of black people and all others that they considered defective or unfit. New York, Ms. E.H. Harriman's gigantic eugenic enterprise at Cold Springs Harbor, Long Island, to ascertain what is the matter with the human race, launched a campaign today for the sterilization of 15 million Americans. Coincident with this uh, amassing statement comes the announcement of the plan of the Eugenic Society which will have at its disposal the vast fortune of Ms. Harriman, liberal financial assistance from John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie, and scientific aid from Alexander Graham Bell, and the greatest host of scientists ever joined in a great undertaking. So you've got America's finest leaders all bought in. So black people, I'm going to have you stand up very quickly. Just please stand really 
quickly. How and when can you ever escape this? Your, your parents weren't able to escape it. Your grandparents weren't able to escape it. Your children, our children, are suffering through it right now. And yet, we render the harshest criticisms about each other onto black children. And we never turn it the other way to look at the ill society and value system that has been constructed here in America. And it's because we don't know. And I'm not saying this to blame or shame. I didn't know. And once I did this research, I said, wow, this is more than what we thought it is. Because we think of each other right now today on these terms. I guarantee you, for most of you, it won't be one day before you're thinking or saying something negative about another black person. All right, you can have a seat. I'm almost done. So here's what Adolf Hitler learned from white American culture. Create justifications and rationalizations to inflict and perpetuate harm against said inferiorized group of people. Incentivize people who align themselves with and support cultural values, philosophies, and systems that perpetuate harm. Because before Hitler was able to pull off what he then pulled off in terms of the Holocaust, he had to create an unfavorable orientation around those Germans and Jewish people. Do you understand? And that took a number of years, but larger society began to buy into it. And then you also penalize people who align themselves, um, or who don't align themselves, rather, with, uh, with and support the cultural values, philosophies, and systems that perpetuate the harm. You've got to penalize those individuals to put them in their place. So if I hire too many black people at one of these organizations, HR is going to come and talk to me. You seem to have like a, a bias. I just want you to know. Never mind. Every other department is full of white people. <laughs> Never mind. Dante is just out of a job. OK. And so Dr. Alva Pusani says, I think we have to establish that white racism is a mental illness. Many white social scientists would like to define racism as something that is normal as a cultural variant. As long as we approach it that way, we really don't deal with the pathology of racism itself. It's like saying that cancer, because a lot of people have it in this society, is somehow normal. So what do current day examples of anti-black sociopathy and psychopathology look and sound like? We've got the LA Council person, Nuri Martinez, who had to resign her position at the end of last year because she referred to her colleague's son, a, a young black boy, he said he looked like a monkey, that he uh, was, they were acting like he was a white child in terms of them, them raising him, as though he, he, this black child doesn't deserve the same types of freedoms and flexibilities that black children deserve. We have the school board member, uh, Ann Sue, here in San Francisco, who said, from, it, from my very limited exposure in the past four months to, this, to the challenges of educating marginalized students, especially in the black and brown community, I see one of the biggest challenges as being the lack of family support for those students. I'm not sure who she's talking about. I had tremendous support from my family and community. How many of you can say that too? But th this is the type of BS that's permeating the, the psychology of this society. She says, unstable family environments caused by housing and food insecurity along with the lack of parental encouragement to focus on learning cause children to not be able to focus, or, nor, or focus on or value learning. That makes teachers work harder because they have to take care of the emotional and behavioral issues of students before they can teach them. That is not fair to the teachers. Just pure ignorance. So Dr. Bobby Wright says, in their relationship with the black race, whites are psychopaths, and their behavior represents an underlying biologically transmitted proclivity with roots deep in their evolutionary history. The psychopath is an individual who is constantly in conflict with other persons or groups. He is unable to experience guilt, is completely selfish and callous, and has a total disregard for the rights of others. 
One of the best methods that can be used to measure the psychopathic traits of the white race is observing and analyzing their universal overt behaviors and attitudes towards blacks. Psychopaths simply ignore the concept of right and wrong. By ignoring this trait in the white race, the lack of ethical and moral development, blacks have made and are still making a tragic mistake in basing the worldwide black liberation movement on moral suasion. It is pathological for blacks to keep attempting to use moral suasion on a people who have no morality where race is the variable. But we've also ingested the psychopathy. So this is Tarek Ali. He says, one thing I hate about dark black women is they always loud and smell rank. If I did date bl females, black bees would be the last thing. We have uh, this pastor here, Dr. Amos Brown, who recently said that black people should not be given a one-time allotment of $5 million because we're not capable of managing our money well, so that it should go into building social programs. And we have to take this to task because this is what's permeating in our families, larger society. We're surrounded by it. It's the air that we breathe. A everyone say anti-blackness. All right, so I'm almost done, I promise you. And then we'll have a five minute break and then we're gonna invite my sister, Margarita. So E. Franklin Frazier in his book, The Black Bourgeoisie in 1957, he says, since the black bourgeoisie live largely in a world of make-believe, the masks which they wear to play their sorry roles conceal the feelings of inferiority and the insecurity and the frustrations that haunt their inner lives. Despite their attempt to escape from real identification with the masses of Negroes, they cannot escape the mark of oppression any more than their less favored kinsmen. In attempting to escape identification with the black masses, they have developed a self-hatred that reveals itself in their deprecation of the physical and social characteristics of Negroes. Likewise, their feelings of inferiority and insecurity are revealed in their pathological struggle for status in the isolated Negro world and craving for recognition in the white world. Their escape into a world of make-believe with its sham society leaves them with a feeling of emptiness and futility, which causes them to constantly seek and escape in new delusions. And so I'm gonna quote from an article that I located by Sage Howard. She says, I grew up in a household where our American dream was black excellence. On the surface, black excellence is simply the celebration of the success of a black person. At its root, however, it measures a person's ability to attain mainstream white standards of success despite facing constant adversity. As I now understand, as I understand it now, black excellence means adhering to respectability politics, a deceptive vehicle that measures my worth by standards set by white men. And that is true for every single one of us. And so Dr. Randy Borman, I'm gonna close with this. He says, the transition into becoming a terrorist is rarely sudden and abrupt. What we know of actual terrorists suggests that there is rarely a conscious decision made to become a terrorist. Most involvement in terrorism results from gradual exposure and socialization towards extreme behavior. And so we have a culture that has been built upon people who have been terrorists against black people. They've been noted as the experts of, uh, of our political system, of our academic system, of our scientific system, of our economic system, everything in this society, and have continued to program decade by decade, over 400 years, people to be terroristic against black people. Thank you. So we'll take a five minute break. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for staying for this portion of the presentation today. It is with great pleasure that I remind us all that we are blessed with the company of Dante King this afternoon. He's already given so much to us in this earlier part of the day. I can assure you that he's exhausted, but at the same time still has much more stamina for this portion. 
So I want to ask you all to be patient with us as we kind of acclimate to this portion as well. I am Marguerite Malloy. I am a friend of Dante's. I consider myself to be a kindred spirit. He blessed me with the opportunity to work with him and edit his book. And it is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to ask him some questions today. I just also want to first say that I'm very grateful. Um, and you hear this from me all of the time, but I have to restate it. I am so grateful that you were put in my life and put in my path. We are kindred spirits and she, I've, I've adopted her as, a, as my sister. She's a brilliant lawyer and one of the quickest and most precise people I have ever met and I just adore you. So thank you for agreeing to thank do you. this. Thank you, thank you. And I won't say that I'm old school <laughs> because I have them written down but I took the time to make sure that I articulated what I wanted to ask. Um, I'm sure we'll be a bit more free-flowing than that, but I will be reading my intros to my questions as well. So Dante, I'm going to start without holding any punches. I'm going to make sure that we all know that we're here to truly hear how you feel, as if we hadn't already. We're going to make sure we truly hear how you feel. But um, quoting from the Legal Defense Fund, critical race theory, sometimes called CRT, is an academic and legal framework that denotes that systemiz systemiz systematic racism or the systemization of racism is part of American society. From education and housing to employment and healthcare, critical race theory recognizes that racism is more than the result of individual bias and prejudice. It is embedded in laws, policies, and institutions that uphold and reproduce racial inequalities. That's a quote from the Legal Defense Fund's website that helps describe critical race theory. Critical race theory was first developed by legal scholars in the 1970s and the 80s following the Civil Rights Movement. And it's now part of uh, what uh, this society thinks of as, as discrimination. As of this year, uh, we have states such as Arkansas, Florida, Idaho, Iowa, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and Tennessee have banned critical race theory in their state legislators. While states like Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, I'm not done, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Washington State and West Virginia have bills currently in their legislatures to ban critical race theory. Only Arizona and Mississippi have defeated the attempts by the legislatures to defeat critical race theory and ban it. And only Delaware has passed legislation affirming the need to teach critical race theory in schools. You've been recently awarded the prestigious position of assistant professor of medical education at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. What would you recommend to others who understand the importance of critical race theory? What do you recommend they do to promote the inclusion of theories such as critical race theory into educational settings? It's a big question. <laughs> so I, I would argue actually that the initial critical race theorists were these white men who developed these philosophies that were used to position white people as superior in that you know, when people like Dr. William Bell came along in the 70s and others, um, Dr. John Henry Clark, um, they were then the coming or emerging with theories in a context that explained away the, uh, the way that anti-blackness, anti-black racism and, and black inferiority 
were used as tools to establish the society. I mean, they um, es essentially created a context or um, theories that explained similarly to what I did here today, um, why things are the way that they are in America as it pertains to um, the situation concerning black people and also the situation concerning white people and how we've assumed this nature that everything that white people represent or that they are is to be adorned. You know, it, it's, it's what we need to be striving for um, and it's toxic at its roots. And so I think that people need to, we don't have to in include necessarily critical race theory or CRT in the way that it is alluded to or the way that it is framed. What we do need to include though is an examination of um, colonial level and state level laws that serve to establish that black men could be castrated, that served that black people um, could be murdered. These laws read over and over and over and over and over again. If a black person get out of line, gets out of line, essentially a white person has the right to correct them and murder them. And if they, they end up murdering them, then there won't be, there, there, there would not necessarily be any consequences. You had white juries that even if cases were brought to court, they sided in favor of these white men who committed the, and, and women who committed these atrocities. These laws established that, um, as I shared the example of the one court case, that black young girls and women couldn't be raped. And so it's not necessarily a situation where we need to include critical race theory. Let's just examine the laws and have an informed discussion about what this country is about and what it's been about and what the activities of white people have been through this history and even in the present and how they're benefiting from it, from it uninformed about all of the bylaws and, and cultural functionalities that were established to organize and set up the white organization, which is white culture as we know it. But it's also the psychology that all of us have ingested and adopted as our own. It's what it means to be American. And so I feel that it is very important to invite people to have an informed discussion. So Dante, I think about higher education and that being a circle you will now enter in a more formal way than you've been in it. And I also think about high school education and elementary school education and middle school education. And in many instances, as we can all probably remember, if you remember anything from high school science or history, it's probably two or three things, right? You know, when the revolution was or who was president. We don't hold a lot and we don't have expectations of teachers and faculty in those environments to bring the level of analysis and information that you have to those rooms. So how do we think about bringing this information down to the level of the first grader or the sixth grader or the 12th grader? How do we do that in a room that's perhaps not a history class, that's perhaps not a social science class or sociology class or anthropology class, but it's a math class and it's an art class. And if they're lucky, they still have sports, if they're lucky. So how can we think about helping to make sure that the information rests with our young people earlier, that we are not who the society created us to, to think we are. Mm -hmm. So I think it requires a level of detail and analysis as well as creativity so that people can become or use their creativity to establish curriculums and exercises that incorporates some of this, this history. Um, and it has to be transformed into different um, types of resources and avenues, such as, you know, social media is huge. There are a lot of 
um, even right now, just different videos that I can locate and that we all can locate on TikTok, um, lectures that we can pull up on YouTube. Uh, this lecture actually today will be placed on YouTube. I have an abundance of, of collateral and lectures um, through that medium. And there are others um, that, are, that you can locate on there. You know, Toni Morrison, I like to pull up her lectures and watch them a lot of times. James Baldwin interviews with um, Malcolm X. Um, Dr. Poussant, who I referenced in, in my work, but we, we have to be willing to commit to sitting still long enough to be able to learn. And, and also, you know, I found um, the majority of my information in books, in a lot of books. books. Wait, wait, books? <laughs> Actual paper? <laughs> books, articles, um, and in papers that, that people have, have written, you know, who in some cases even take an angle that's juxtaposed to mine. And yet I sit here very affirmed in not only my analysis of the situation, but the conclusions. But again, I have other individuals who have come before me, such as Albert Clegg, Dr. John Henry Clark, Malcolm X, um, Stokely Carmichael, Charles uh, Hamilton. I have people like that to thank for providing information that I could dig into, Dr. Cla Claude Anderson, um, and sink my teeth into so that I could immerse myself in enough evidence and data to draw these conclusions. And I think... Um, it is so important, it is so important for people to commit to sitting still and to reading. I'm not necessarily a reader by nature, but if you give me things that I'm interested in, such as, <laughs> such as the research that I uh, have done, I can read all day. My mom says sometimes, you just read and read and read. How do you do that? Um, but you know, I had to cut off the rest of the world for a number of years to be able to do it. And right now, I think we find ourselves um, in, large, in this society dealing with an attention deficit. You know, we can't really sit still for too long because this lecture is too long, this book is too long, this activity is too long, and there has to be a commitment to that. So, sorry, I didn't mean to go off track. Dante, never off track. Do you think that your affiliation with the Mayo Clinic will afford you a platform to continue your very articulate presentation and public outcry around the barbaric acts that we have to experience every day as black people in this society? I believe it will, and the reason that I believe it will is because, you know, I've been uh, working with the Mayo Clinic for over the last year, and, you know, their recognition of my work was something that I did not expect, and yet, and I'll, I'll share this quick story. So I was serving a, a guest faculty for the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF Medical School. And I had a class that uh, became accredited um, through their school that I had been teaching for almost three years. And so um, I had people from Stanford, from Harvard, um, from all of these medical school affiliations, as well as doctors and other clinicians take the course. And so uh, people from the Mayo Clinic took the course. And I, this is, okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna disclose this. I was not familiar with the Mayo Clinic. I didn't know who they were. And so their administrator and um, one of the people who are high up in the organization they attended the course, and then afterwards, they said they sent me an email. Can we meet with you? <laughs> I'm like, sure. They were nice. 
during the course. I'll meet with them because um, I like nice people and I, I'm an energy person. I love good energy. And so I really only took the meeting because they were nice because I was busy at the time. And so we met and they said, we want to incorporate your work. We want to collaborate with you. We think that you are doing something that is cutting edge. We haven't seen anyone necessarily go this deep. Um, and I'll share this with you. The slides I shared today are, they were roughly 128 slides out of a deck of 3,000 plus slides, okay? So they said, we haven't seen anything like this uh, previously. Want to collaborate? And I'm like, sure. So you're going to send me maybe a proposal for a contract. I can come in, do training. They say, we're, we're thinking something larger than that. So I get off the phone. I start calling um, a few of my friends who are doctors and clinicians. And I said, oh, I have a, this to do, this to do, this to do. And I've got to respond to this um, proposal that I was given in this meeting with the, the Mayo Clinic. And you should have heard my friends. They were like, the Mayo Clinic? Are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. And they said, do you know who they are? And I'm like, who are they? <laughs> I had to Google who they were. Thank goodness for Google. So one of my friends, she's a doctor of nursing at Alabama, um, at Oakwood University, actually in Alabama, Dr. Dorothy Ford. She says, think of Kaiser. Kaiser is D-list. <laughs> the Mayo Clinic is A-list. And so... Um, because of my affiliation with the Mayo Clinic, I've had so many people reaching out to me, um, doctors that I don't know, um, educational professionals that I, I'm not affiliated with, and it's, it's been great. So I, I absolutely believe that it will allow um, not only the Mayo Clinic, but other uh, organizations who are affiliated with the Mayo Clinic and just other medical institutions and uh, universities especially to become familiar uh, with my work and to immerse themselves in a level of granular discussion about anti-blackness and medical education that hasn't um, been present previously. But I also want to recognize um, the scholarship of, and I mentioned them earlier, Dr. Harriet Washington, Deidre Cooper Owens, but also Dr. Joy DeGruy, because they have really set the stage for me to be doing what I'm doing right now. Thank you. As you know, the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah Jones has been attacked as an inaccurate rendering of history. Hannah Jones has said that the history we learn and teach is shaped by the people who decide what's important and what's not. And that erasure is also a powerful statement in history. Your work unearths legal, scientific, economic, and social truths which are not included in much of the history taught and discussed in academia. Given the erasure of blacks from American history, tell us why you chose to embark on revealing the hidden legal, scientific, economic, and social history this country was founded on. So <clears throat> I didn't start off wanting to do that. That was, it wasn't even um, a goal of mine. I just started off being curious and reading a lot of books. And as I started um, that process, what, what became a process, I started recording resources. I started saving information into different documents. And then one day I pulled up a PowerPoint. <laughs> I was like, I've got to put names and faces <laughs> with these People, I've got to put names and faces and, and books and references and resources with this information that I'm learning. And I started doing it because I was emotionally compelled. to. I could not believe what I was reading. I could not believe what I was seeing. 
and it was painful. There were days I would just cry. I, I, would, I had to stay in bed. When I found out about the, the different rape laws and excluding black women from rape, I thought of every black woman in my family, from my grandparents to my cousins, and also how prevalent you know, molestation has been in black families within the black community. And it made me sick. I could not stop myself from crying. I had to walk away from my research for almost six months. I, ju I just could not believe it. And so I said, I know if it's impacting me this way, it's gonna impact others in, in the same way. But here's what I did not know or didn't understand. I made the mistake initially of assuming and presuming that academics in the, in the legal field, in legal scholarship, uh, in law schools, as well as, as doctors, you know, th they already know this. This is what they learn. And so I was uh, contracted to do some work for a group of attorneys, and I'm presenting on bias, and I begin using some of <laughs> these examples and some of this work. And the, the lawyers who were in the room, their, their, their mouths, their jaws just were dropped. And so I started going through more slides, and I, I paused, I stopped maybe 10 or 15 slides in, and I said, are, are you all not taught this in law school? They said, absolutely not. I had the San Francisco public defender tell me, this is unbelievable, I've never seen any of this ever. The director of the California, executive director of the California Preterm Birth Initiative, Ms. Alexis Cobb, and she's here with us today, she hired me to do some training at UCSF. All of the doctors in the room were shocked. And this is when I knew I need, to, I need to make this work larger. I need to make it available for the masses. And so I'm just grateful for you know, people that I, I refer to as my tribe, which includes you, people like Ms. Brenda Barrow, Cheryl, Cheryl Thornton, Ingrid Cobb, um, Kate Levinson, Robert Williams, um, Alexis, my sister Lori Smith-Anderson, my sister Rhonda, Shauna. I'm grateful that I have people who have allied with me to create and make available platforms to be able to share this work. And as you mentioned, now the Mayo Clinic, um, UCSF, and a host of conferences and other um, activities that I participate in. Dante, I say this from a spirit of readiness, because I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. So when we get ready to fight in Brooklyn, you just take your earrings out, put your Vaseline on, and you go at it. So I'm now sitting here in this position, about to take my earrings out and put some Vaseline on, because we live in a world where what's called the council culture is very, very prevalent. So I have concerns that you will be under attack to be canceled. Not that that should be at the forefront of your mind, but so that when I get my Vaseline and my sneakers on, I know which way to go. Tell me what preparation you're doing or thinking, or is that entering into your sphere as you think about going forward with the Mayo Clinic, going forward to continue to do this work? Is this cancer culture we live in? Because I, I, have, I have knives in my car we can take care of its tires. I mean, you know, I, you know I, I just stand, I stand at the ready. I stand at the ready. I've been canceled um, on occasion yeah. and occasions. Uh, recently. Uh, so I understand what cancel culture does to a career, to a vision, to a community, to a family, to friends, to people you thought were allies. Yeah. So as you, I hope that it's not something you hold every day, but I don't want you to be taken by surprise as Nicole Hannah-Jones um, recognized when the president, former President Trump came for her. We live in a cancel culture. Tell me what you're thinking and how you prepare so that we can all get ready. To, to stand with you when that council culture attack comes. Thank you, thank you. So I don't focus on it. I, I cannot focus on it at all. Um, I had a, a woman who was one of my best friends 
and we kind of sparred with, uh, with each other over me writing this book. For those of you who don't know, and I'll say it again here today, when I wrote the book and I was at the point of, I'm going to put this out, I was at a point of committing suicide. And I meant my book to be a last will and testament to other black people and especially black children. Um, because it is, as much as it is meant or, or should serve as a level of instruction in terms of how to understand these psychodynamics of white supremacy and anti-blackness, it's also instruction to black people. It's also, it should also serve as a tool of validation that it is not you that, it, that is inferior. It is not you that has something wrong with you. It is the context that you're in that is destructive, that is not meant for your good. It is meant for your destruction. And so you need to, to validate yourself, all of your family members. There's not one condition that has been arranged or set up in this society that black people are responsible for. Not one. Not Pookie going to jail because he robbed the bank or Quita prostituting herself. If sex work was legal, when white men were in control of it, why can't black women benefit from it? So I am inviting people to participate in a deeper consciousness. I know people will come after me. My mother prays for me all of the time. I have other family members who are in prayer over me. And yet, I had to decide what meant more to me. Did it mean more for my life to be used for my purposes? Or did it mean more for me to possibly compromise myself and not be able to, to work anywhere or for other organizations? My friend, the one that I sparred with, she says, you'll never be hired at another institution ever again. And I said, I'm fine with that because I'm not going to be here anyway. And so I think of, you know, I have thought the question that you asked, that's been mentioned to me. But the threats that I received when I put this book out and people wanting to come after me, I'm more concerned about that, you know. And if someone does decide to um, attack me violently or if I end up, you know, dead, which I don't want that to happen, I'll knock on wood. But it happens to people who come, who, it happens to people it happened to Medgar Evers, it happened to Martin Luther King, it ha happened to Malcolm X, it happens to anyone who chooses to um, fervently and, and commercially uh, disagree with this cultural environment and anyone who espouses an opinion that does not favor or align with the masses. And I just can't be concerned about that because it would, that's nowhere in my purpose at all whatsoever. So no, I have no attention going there. Okay. And I, we'll, we'll just have to be ready for you, Dante. We'll, we'll have to be on the yes. for you. And I'll invite people to read my book, read the books that are re referenced at the end of my book, and take my courses. Because it's all there. I'm not saying anything that I can't back up. And I appreciate you leading with readiness because I had to get ready. I didn't just decide to do this one day. <laughs> this is over 20 years, you know, from me being an African-American studies major to endeavoring into my own independent study and research after that formal education. So thank you. Dante, as you know, academia, through the adoption of science, has been used to support racial discrimination. You almost made me spit my water. <laughs> Using the pronouncements of science, their ideas become science. 
their thoughts, their fears become science. Um, it's been used, academia's been used to create whatever was desired to be called science, uh, to systematically take groups, organizations, people, uh, people who, who've been labeled as, as insane or retarded or as inferior, and identify that they have cognitive behavioral traits or cognitive traits that make them less than. Uh, do you perceive today that your role at the Mayo Clinic um, can help contribute to that institution rethinking what it has deemed as science, what it has relied upon prior to now as science? Yes, that is my goal. And I, I want to recognize or lift up something that my dear sister Alexis Cobbins has said to me over and over again. She says, Dante, do you realize how many black lives you're going to save as these black women go for care, as, as they're having you know, children? Um, do, you, do you realize how much your work is gonna impact and influence people who are treating our community? It's going to make them think twice. She says, your, your work is so valuable. And I've, I've heard that from others, uh, including uh, some of my, of my colleagues at the Mayo Clinic. Um, but she was the first person to say that to me. And I just really appreciate and value you for helping me to, to see that. She, I, I knew it inherently, but you took it and sat it right in front of me. Um, and it, it made me cry. Um, initially when I heard it, so thank you. We're hopeful that that's what your role will do also there. And I'm actually hopeful that your engagement and your relationship with them will span a very long time because I think it takes a very long time to penetrate the institutions that exist because they don't, they're not designed to be penetrated. They're designed to go along to get along. So I'm hoping your affiliation is long so that you can do the work that needs to be done because it can't be done with a course. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be done when you become the president of the Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. in a few years. Okay. And I, I just wanna lift up, even as I've been going through this journey with my mom, with her recovery, you know, I've, I've had doctors indicate <clears throat> that we have higher pain thresholds, um, we have um, higher bone density, they didn't wanna give my mom medicine, they held out on a particular medicine um, because she looked strong she looks strong. And that's dangerous. Because there are people who, who will be violent, who will commit violence over that type of mismanagement and mistreatment. You know, I was looking and I told my brother, I said, I understand, not that I am uh, advocating for this or even encouraging it, but I understand how people go violent or postal in, in some of these situations because it is mismanagement and negligence at its core in dealing with care concerning black people. My father, who is here today, Harold King, um, he experienced something in 2021, and I was on my way to the hospital to get him. He was incoherent. He had been pumped with all of this medication. And when I arrived at the Kaiser in Oakland, he was sitting outside in a chair by himself alone with his shirt unbuttoned. I almost hit the sky. I could not believe it. I just, I, I could do nothing but cry. I was so angry. And so we have to understand um, the level, the magnitude of unsafety in, in America as it pertains to black identity and black community, community and culture. Dante, I remember a story from one of the participants at a session of yours where uh, it was 2022 at the time, so the person was recounting what happened in 21, and the person was a female black doctor here at a local hospital. And she mentioned that she went into the hospital to have her, her, her child, which was, not even nine months before this conversation in 22. And uh, while she was on the table uh, finishing delivering, she was asked did she want to have her tubes tied. Yeah. 
I think all of us can appreciate that not one white woman in America has been asked after she gave birth, was she interested in having her tubes tied? But the concept of encouraging sterilization, encouraging us to not procreate is a prevalent reality in society. Uh, if a young woman is pregnant, a black woman, it's perceived that this child is unwanted, this child was an accident, this child's not gonna be cared for, this child's not gonna be raised in a two-parent household, this married couples are perceived to be people who should not be happy to. I mean, so the, the reality for what we experience today in medicine, uh, your father, your mother, uh, this, this sister, doctor, it's, it's 2023. And this is what we experience when we receive medical care. Can I just comment on that? Please. <clears throat> so while I was, um, <clears throat> while working at the city and county of San Francisco, I led a, a implicit bias uh, training project that was delivered to the San Francisco Police Department. And I actually presented some information uh, in front of the San Francisco Police Commission about that experience. I led the team that did it. And in my presentation to them, and, and also in an earlier email that I had written to the chief of police, Bill Scott, I communicated that the cops would say certain things. They had certain uh, beliefs that they were functioning with. And one of the opinions that I began to hear, my team and I began to hear over and over and over again, is that black people were, black babies were predisposed to commit violence when they were um, growing in the womb. Do you understand that? that? That we're predisposed to commit violence, that these were the beliefs that these officers were then going out into the community to police with. So if you already have your mind made up that black people are predisposed to commit violence, that black people are inferior, even the doctor that I referenced during my presentation who said that he allied with uh, others in the community when he was at Duke University to go around and locate black females, black 16-year-old virgins, and, and hysterectomize them. I don't think we fully understand how diabolical, how maniacal these, these people have been. These are the people, the leaders of our society, of our culture. Do you realize how disconnected one has to be in order to commit that type of harm, in order to not see these other people who are clearly humans because they're creating laws that recognize our humanity, they're just debasing it. Do you realize how disconnected th that those type of people must be? And I have a white friend who said to me, Dante, what I get from your teachings in, in this uh, information is that these laws begin to replace the humanity of white people because we are, a group that follows the rules, that, that follows the laws. And so as these laws are being structured and, and implemented into this uh, environment, into this uh, country, we're just following them. You know, we become terrorists as it pertains to black people. And this is true for black people too, in the ways that we deal with, with each other. Because our judgments come from white standards. You're only, a, you're only smart if you're a black boy or girl if your intelligence aligns with what has been produced through this educational system and framework. You're only well presented, Dante, if you wear a nice suit and tie and you dress in the ways that white people have deemed presentable and acceptable. And that's true for our language, it's true for the way, way that we wear our hair, all of it. And my next question, you point out that no one, black people included, are immune from the values of whiteness and white dominance because it's fundamentally the water that we swim in and the air that we breathe. This water and air dictates what is ignored and what is validated and what is not. Based on and grounded in this truth, do we need to conclude that we have assimilated? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And, and so the sociopathy and the psychopathy permeates black people in black culture and community because we are the creation of these white people. That's not true of any other group. Most, if not all of us who sit here today, if you have ancestry that goes back beyond five or six generations, and, and your European ancestry happened at that point, as is with, with me, then you're not here by choice at all whatsoever. You know, and I sit here today with roughly 20% of European blood in my genes or in my veins uh, that is the result of things that happened in the 19th century. I went back and traced it in my ancestry on my mother's side and my dad's side. Um, and so we have to then understand being the creation and socially, culturally, legally, edu edu <laughs> educationally um, controlled by this group of people who classified themselves as white people that we are them. We are them. And we also have to recognize those parts about us that we need to change in relationship to each other. There's so much to be said about this. And I want to invite you all today. I referenced uh, E. Franklin Fraser's work around the black bourgeoisie. Every black person, go and read that book so you can have a better understanding of what your great-grandparents were tr attempting to strive for what your grandparents were attempting to strive for, your parents, and how they told you you need to go to school and do well and do all of these things so that you can get the master's degree, you can get the PhD, and once you got it, you still couldn't escape anti-blackness. Your last statement reminds me of something, Dante. My um, son, who's gonna graduate from grad school in June, said, um, Mom, you did me a disservice because you and Dad spent all this time teaching me about white, the whiteness of the world we live in and how black people are see, seen, perceived, et cetera. He said, you did me a disservice because now I understand that it's not gonna change. No matter what, you know, whatever I do, it's not gonna change. He said, um, and so it's so unfair. It's so unfair that I, that I know that, that I didn't get a chance to grow up in the world of not understanding that that is real. And I smiled because I felt pride that we had taught him that. And I said to him, well, let's be honest, if I had told you it was this bad, would you have tried as hard? And so we had to appreciate that, yes, I told you the truth. I told you the truth so that you could try hard despite what's going on, right? Rather, rather than being concerned about ever succeeding, but knowing that you are a success from the moment you take a breath, regardless of what the people around you say and do, because they will never allow you to feel successful, right? Um, so that personal story to the side, Dante. Um, um, you know, we hear a lot the phrase that black folk pull the race card. We play the race card. What's your response to the concept that black folk play the race card? It was given to us to play. <laughs> we didn't create the classification of Negro or black. Those individuals from those African communities and regions, they weren't calling themselves that. There, there were uh, the Spaniards, the French, the, then the, 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 the Portuguese, Portuguese, Spaniards, French, then the, the English, Christian. would you say? Christian. Right, Christian people who decided as they were trading and or for the most part kidnapping these African uh, individuals, they decided that they would classify them as black or Moro, right? Dark-skinned people. We didn't decide that. So this whole idea of race is the creation of white people. And it, it really, um, it's laughable how, you know, these people are set up in this society to be so ignorant 
in basic um, that they espouse or, or make these assertions about the race card, they're, they're, it, it represents a, a level of immaturity, ignorance, and deficiency that, that goes uninterrogated. You know, and I think one of the, the things that I have begun interrogating, along with my sister, Dr. Caritha Mitchell, is the mediocrity of whiteness, the deficiency of whiteness that exists. That even in a culture where everything has been built to reinforce you, to deem you as superior and smart, You can still show up and be deficient. I know that I had to navigate environments where I ran circles around the non-black people who were in the room. And they would compliment me. They would say, wow, Dante, how are you able to get so much done? You are just amazing. And I would smile, not understanding and not knowing that I was trained that way because my mother told me I had to work two to three times as hard as white people just to be seen as good enough. And I, and I say to black people nowadays, though, the functionality of that is destructive at its core because you're exhausting yourself, trying to be the best that you can. You devote so much energy, time, and commitment to being this way, and then you show up with people who get to have fun on weekends, who don't do their jobs, who are not good at their jobs, who are uncreative, incompetent, and it's not interrogated. So it's not just that you're doing a great job, Rhonda, that you're brilliant, that you're amazing. It's that these people are mediocre and deficient as well. So we have to begin to interrogate white mediocrity um, and the favorable orientations that have been established and set around white identity and even groups that white people have positioned as valuable minorities, model minorities, such as uh, certain East Asian communities. The interrogation uh, is essential, and the information you've shared and the, your work really gives us a basis to start that interrogation and to give people trust that uh, even questioning the existence as it is, is a concern. Don't you look at your phone. Will we run out of time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How much time do we have left? This can be the last question. Okay. 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 Well, I'll ask one that's uh, dear to my heart. Uh, Non-black people and I do that because I don't always want to center whiteness, so it's not about white people, it's about non-black people, assert that designating it essential to black people to have black-only spaces is segregation. And that, isn't that what you were supposed to be fighting against all through the civil rights movement? What's your response, Don? Context is everything, and so the lack of nuance in understanding why having all black space is necessary is, again, the result of, of sometimes ignorance, but a lack of a, a willingness and a want and desire to understand why black people need those spaces. Yes, not everyone argued for um, integration. Not everyone wanted it. Even Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King didn't want it in certain contexts. He says, no, we shouldn't be, you know, put in a position where we have to use separate bathrooms or un unable to drink from this water fountain or eat in this, in this restaurant. But in terms of white teachers teaching our young babies, absolutely not. He says, these people have a low opinion of black people and it would damage our community. So everything deserves context and nuance. And there's, again, this is a situation, this is an example rather that goes uninterrogated when it comes to white people in white communities. Most of the affluent upper middle class, middle class communities where white people live in this country are segregated. So it's okay if they have their communities, we're not welcomed into it, but it's problematic when black people do it and that represents the core of what I am discussing in my book around anti-blackness. Even someone I was talking to my friend who has a black son, and she said, my son said to me the other day, 
that he does not, he wants to date Mexican girls. He does not want to date black women. And when I asked him why, she's black, when I, she says, when I asked him why, he said, black women are too loud. Everybody is loud or can be loud at, at a point in time. But I, I said to her, I said, he's using that as a justification. Loudness is not, there's not a problem with loudness at its core if Tim and Bobby and his, his friends that he plays video games with are being loud. It may, it may not even be a problem if white women or Mexican women are being loud, but black women? There's an anti-black sentiment. And she said to him, well, mommy's not loud. I said, you shouldn't have even dignified that. So he said to her, yes, you are. Well, you laugh loud. I said, wow, now it's the laugh. Right? Next is the hair, the cheekbones. It's, it's unfavorable. You can be doing the same thing that others are doing, and it's just seen differently on you. That is a sickness. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a round of applause and thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you, Dante, for sharing your wisdom, your heart, your spirit, and your purpose with us.